Hello and welcome to Victoria Planet. I've been on break for a couple of weeks and now I'm back. I thought that I would answer some of the questions I've been getting. There's maybe 52 videos out there now that I've done and I've been asked so many questions and I get emails every day asking me questions. And these are really good questions and I thought I would share some of them with you and we could all learn from the answers uh, to these questions. So let's start. Now, first of all, I'm going to mention the first name or the handle of the person that asked the question, and I hope I pronounce it correctly because I, I'm not sure sometimes exactly how to pronounce them. So forgive me if I get that wrong. Um, but I'm going to start at the oldest videos I've done and work forward through time. And in this video, I'm going to just cover the first roughly 50% of my videos. I'm not going to answer every single question I've been asked. I've tried to pick out some of the most common questions I've been asked. Um, and maybe some of the most interesting questions to those who watch the channel. So, first of all, we're going to go right back to that video of war to stop fixing techniques. And Frank asked a question. Do pyro developers require a certain kind of fixer? Now, I've been asked this question many times, and it's a really good question. Um, in my opinion, if you want to maximize the stain on your pyro negative, you really want to be keeping the whole development process alkaline. This is to maximize the stain. Now, I know that some um, photographers uh, do use regular fixers. Uh, high pam, for instance, is mentioned. Um, and these seem to work okay. And they don't seem to have a problem with stain. But I want to maximize the stain and I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I possibly can to, to get the best stain in key with my negative in image as I can. And so I use a alkaline a fixer and keep the whole process alkaline. I don't use an acid stop bath. I use a water-based stop bath. Um, I do three rinses of water at 20 centigrade. Keep your, your stop bath water at the same temperature as your developer and keep your fixer at the same temperature as the other three. This is really, really important, guys. We mustn't mess with the temperatures. And the reason we mustn't mess with that is because we can cause a thing called reticulation. It increases the grain in your negative and it also can reticulate the emulsion, which means um, the expansion and contraction due to the different temperatures of the different processing chemicals can expand and contract the emulsion and create marks, create um, a, a messy looking image in the background that ruins the negative. So always keep your temperatures within a couple of degrees. I like within one degree of my developer and I develop almost always at 20 centigrade. I went a bit off topic there, but I think that's one of the good things about answering these questions, I, I will go off topic. Um, Redun asks the question, I have recently got some 510 Pyro, which I intend to use with FP4, Pan F, and possibly HP5. It works great, by the way, with all of those films. Um, 510 Pyro is a marvelous developer with Ilford Films. Do I have to use an alkaline fixer? No, you don't. You can use Ilford High Pam. It's used by um, a lot of photographers, even with pyro developers. Uh, but if you want to maximize your stain, I would use an alkaline fix. Uh, Regarling asks, do you just put the developer back in at this point after the fix? And how long is this a necessary step? Now, this is a really good question because when PMK became popular back at the end of the 90s, early 2000s. It was originally recommended that you would put the developer back into your tank after fixing the film. So you'd fix the film, finish fixing, pour out the fixer, and then pour in the PMK developer and agitate it once every 30 seconds for two minutes. Then you would pour out the reused developer and you would then wash and, um, and dry the film. 
That was originally recommended back in nine, the end of the 90s, the early 2000s. This is no longer recommended. Um, now, I know I've read some instructions recently from the formulary, actually, for one of their developers, and it's still recommended to put in the developer at the end of fixing to increase the overall stain, the stain of the negative. This is no longer recommended. I certainly do not recommend it. The reason I don't recommend it, and others as well as me, is that it creates a general stain across the whole negative. It basically increases the, um, the fog level of the negative, making it harder for the enlarger light or the scanner to see through the negative and get the image. So no, I don't recommend putting the developer back in at the end of fixing. Andre, he asked, how would you reuse the fixer for another film? Well, you can reuse fixers many times. You don't need to use a fixer only once. So um, it's one of those things, fixer, is that you can keep continuously using it film after film until it starts to slow down too much. And the way to work that out is when you first use a fresh batch of fix on a film, measure the clearing time. Now, I've shown you how to do that in one of my videos. Basically, after 15 to 30 seconds, I open, off fixing, I open the tank and I have a look at the film. Now, if the film is still milky, I continue fixing, watching the film. Now, I dunk the film in the fixer, watching it until it clears. That is called the clearing time. And then I fix for twice the clearing time. Some people recommend three times the clearing time. I don't think that's necessary. It never has been necessary since 18 whenever, when they invented photography. But So twice the clearing time is, a, is, is perfectly good for fixing the film. When you measured the time of clearing, when the milkiness has left the film and it's now clear, make a note of that time and write it on the bottle of your fix. Keep using the fixer in subsequent films, and when the fix takes twice as long to clear the film, it's finished, it's expired. You can use it for that film, it's okay, don't worry about that film. But now you know you need to make a fresh batch of fix when it's reached twice the clearing time of when it was fresh, okay? So that's a really simple way to know whether your fix is expired or not. Making 510 Pyro Film Developer is the next video. So Frank asks, has bromide drag ever been an issue with full stand development with 510? And the answer is no. 510 is a very, very good stand developer. Um, you don't, I've never experienced bromide drag in any of the films I've used in 510 Pyro. Uh, Rodinol's the same. Um, the reason is that the developing agents in 510 and Rodinol Primary, the primary developing agents are not affected very much by bromide. Um, metol is affected by bromide and that is not a good stand developer uh, because of bromide drag. The bromide slows down the development by the metol so you can see this in the negative where the heavy bromide, which is a byproduct of development, drags down the film and as it's dragging down because it's heavier than the liquid around it, it's also slowing down the development of the developer. Only in those areas though where it's dragging down and those are always areas where there's a lot of development activity going on. So the 510 Power is one of the best stand developers out there. Uh, ex extremely good indeed. It could be used up to one plus 500 for stand development. Uh, and Rodinol as well, I recommend that as a great stand developer. Dave said, I ordered PyroCat HD in liquid form, but I'm hesitant to use it due to worries about safety. These are really good worries because any pyrogallal pyrocatechin based developer is poisonous. Um, they are poisonous chemicals, as are many chemicals that we use in the darkroom. Um, hydroquinone is another very poisonous chemical. We use it in the darkroom a lot. D76 is hydroquinone. Many of those developers have hydroquinone. So what do we do about that? Well, Certainly, we must take sensible precautions. These chemicals are dangerous, but only if misused and not used carefully. So be careful with any chemical in the darkroom. When I mix 
these developers. I mix them outside where I'm in the fresh air and I always make sure, and this is a, a tip, tip of the day, to have the wind behind me. Make sure that the breeze is coming behind me and blowing any dust away from me. And that way you're safe, that you're not going to breathe in any of the dust, which is quite dangerous. Um, another thing is ingesting through the mouth, of course, so never eat or smoke inside of your dark room because that's how you're going to ingest these things in through your mouth. Another thing is use gloves. Use gloves when you're developing with these chemicals because when you get the wet chemical on your skin, you will absorb some of the poison. So just keep gloves on. And the best gloves you can buy are the nitrile type gloves, in my opinion, uh, because they seem to have a better resistance to chemicals getting through them. Uh, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to wear goggles, wear goggles. Do whatever it takes to make sure you feel comfortable and safe with any chemicals in your darkroom. Daniel asks, same video, you do not recommend a pre-soak. Is there a reason why you don't pre-soak while developing with 510 Pyro? Well, sometimes I do pre-soak. Um, I don't recommend to pre-soak with every developer all the time. The reason for that is the industry making films, they add things to the emulsion of the film. These additives help the developer be absorbed by the emulsion. Uh, they're sort of wetting agents. Um, whenever you've been developing, if you open the tank and check the temperature halfway through, don't open the tank halfway through, when you open the top, the lid, and put your thermometer in, to check the temperature of the developer. You may see bubbles in there that look like some kind of, um, um, some wetting agent has been used. Well, this is actually things that have been put into the emulsion to help the developer. So if you pre-soak or pre-wet your film, you're gonna wash those away. So that's one reason not to use them. But there are reasons to use a pre-soak as well. And that is, in my case, when I have a large temperature difference in my darkroom, between my 20 degrees developing temperature and the darkroom temperature, which happens a lot because my darkroom is outside in the garden in a hut. Um, then I use a pre-soak to warm up the developing tank and make sure that my spool and my film and my tank is all at 20 degrees. And so I put some water in 20 degree water uh, and leave it a couple of minutes to try and get those temperatures up as much as possible. So that's a reason to use a pre-soak. Um, another reason to use a pre-soak is if you have a very short developing time or a very active developer. So the short developing time would be a concentrated developer such as a D76 used um, a stock solution. Um, that's a strong developer and so you want to even out as much as possible the early part of development. So you could use a pre-soak then if you wanted. Um, and the other example I gave is if you have a strong developer that needs a regular agitation. Now I'm thinking of PMK, for instance, that enjoys an agitation of every 15 seconds. Um, with that developer, a pre-soak is beneficial because the developer clearly needs um, regular um, movement around the film and when you initially put a dry film into that developer, it's going to soak up the developer at different rates. And so a pre-soak might be helpful in that situation. But I don't think they're essential. What is essential is that you try to standardize how you develop your film. So if you're going to pre-soak, always pre-soak. Always pre-soak the same way, at the same temperature, etc. This way, when you find your development times for that developer, you know they're going to be the same every time. If sometimes you pre-soak and sometimes you don't with the developer, you're going to get different development times and therefore your negatives are going to be different and more difficult to process afterwards. Uh, Nomurse Arms asks, I've used Ilford Hypam Rapid Fix with Pyro developers and I have not seen any reduction in the amount of stain. Well, that's a very good point. Some photographers just use Hypam as their fixer and they don't bother with an alkaline fix. Now, Hypam is slightly acidic. 
I use an alkaline fix with a pyro developer because I want to maximize the stain. Technically, I could use high pam if I wanted, and as long as I did it the same every time, I would get used to the results I get from that particular methodology. But I particularly like to maximize the stain with a pyro developer, so I keep everything alkaline. And a lot of studies have been done on this by the makers of these developers. Um, PMK was studied a lot, um, and um, the recommendation was for an alkaline um, workflow. So no stop bath, alkaline fix. Um, when I say no stop bath, still use a water stop bath. So three changes, I use three changes of water at 20 centigrade. Always keep your water at the same temperature as your developer. It's important. Um, if you change temperatures, you're going to reticulate the film and you're going to get clumpier grain and potentially ruin the emulsion and get an awful background image uh, which is just terrible you can't use the negative anymore so moving on the next uh, video is the twizzle stick video and i got some interesting questions on that jason said i found when using the stick that my films were not developed evenly more in the center and less on the edge this is a really good uh, point this is typical of poor agitation technique and it's not jason's fault but twizzle stick agitation can create this agitation problem where the edges of the film are developed differently from the center of the film. And I'm talking about when you look at the film, if you looked at the film this way, if you held it up, 35 millimeter in what I'm demonstrating, the center of the film would be different to the edges of the film. And this is usually caused because you're twizzling too much and too fast. Slow down and don't give quite as much agitation. In the demonstration, I think I show that I turn it two or three times gently to the right, and sometimes I'll go back a couple of times as well. And that's it, till the next minute, and then two or three times at the speed to the right, and then back a couple. When I say to the right, it's because that's the open end of the film inside of the developing tank. And I'm forcing fresh developer into the film. So I just turn it two or three times like that. Now, that doesn't give me any agitation issues at all. The negatives are perfect. So if you're getting this difference in agitation, this difference in development of your negative, it's because of your agitation technique and try to change it to stop that. Of course, inversion agitation also gives you uh, problems if you overdo that. Um, and in that case, you'll see lines running down the sprockets between the sprocket holes. And these lines are very clear and they run right down from top to bottom. You'll see them coming in top to bottom. And that's over agitation. You're agitating too fast and the the developers moving too quickly and too often and it creates these lines straight down your film. Um, Drew asks, for the agitation, do you do it for the first minute and then 10 seconds for each minute after or just 10 seconds at each minute? So when you're using a twizzle stick to agitate, um, use your regular agitation regimen, whatever that is. So um, if I'm doing a Kodak agitation, I will do the first 30 seconds, so I'll continually turn for the first 30 seconds, like this, gently, and then I stop, and then I agitate for five seconds every 30 seconds. That's Kodak. If I'm doing an Ilford agitation, then I will agitate for the first 30 seconds to a minute, and I always do the same for each film, so whatever I've chosen, whatever I've worked out is best for that film, I will do. And then every minute, I'll give it 10 seconds. Three to the right, one back. Three to the right, one back. Like that. So twizzle stick agitation is exactly the same methodology or timing as inversion agitation. There's no difference. SD asked, when do you do this kind of agitation? And when do you do the inversion method? That's a really good question. Yeah, well, 
with PMK that needs a lot of agitation every 15 seconds, I use inversion agitation because I feel that I need to really in in agitate that developer and mix it up. So I do a good inversion agitation every 15 seconds. With a slower developer that maybe I'm developing for 15 minutes, 20 minutes with Perceptol for instance, I will use the stick agitation, the twizzle stick. It's a gentler agitation. With Rodinal, I'll often use the twizzle stick because the gentle agitation with Rodinal seems to improve the grain a little. So I'll, I'll do that too. So, yeah, I try to stick to the same method every time. So if I've experimented with a developer in a film and I've tried twizzle stick and I found out I like that, I like the grain, I like the look of what I've got there. I write it down, I make good notes and I use that technique next time and again and again. Um, some people prefer the twizzle stick all the time. Um, advantages is there's less chance of getting um, air bells, bubbles forming because you're not agitating so much so the developer isn't swishing around as much. Um, there's also less chance of getting inversion agitation marks that we talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, horses for courses. The next video is making D23 with teaspoons. Let's see what questions we've got for that. So Guido asked, I've just mixed up this developer with your spoon method. Thanks for the detailed explanation. I'm planning on using it undiluted with the replenishment that you explain on your website. Any ideas on calculating development times? So D23 uh, was designed by Kodak to be an improvement actually on D76. It came much later than D76, um, nearly 20 years later, I think. Um, and it's a simpler developer and it works as well, if not a little better than D76. For development times, start with D76 development times and go from there. They'll get, get you right in the ballpark of where you need to be. I find with D23, I need a little bit longer than D76 development times, maybe 10 or 15% longer to get the contrast that I like from it. Now, if you're replenishing with D23, you'll find that as you replenish and the bromides inside of the developer starts to build up, and this is part of the advantage of replenishment, you want those bromides building up, these byproducts from film development, you'll find that your development times will increase, but they will stabilize. So after the first few films have gone through the developer, you'll find then that your development times increase, but will stabilize at slightly longer than your earlier ones. You'll very soon get used to this. And once you've got those longer stabilized development times, that's it. You're fixed in those, it's great, and it will work every time the same beautifully. And it will be sharper, and your grain will be finer, and it's a beautiful developer. The tone is beautiful with replenishment. Dick asked, as a former clinical chemist student, I do prefer using scales, but it doesn't make my pictures any better than the teaspoon method. And this is a really good point, Dick. Yes, scales are more accurate, there's no doubt about it. And I use scales, most of the time I use scales. But the teaspoon techniques to make these developers were designed way back, 100 years ago, and worked perfectly well. And they still work perfectly well today. There's no reason to have to go out and buy scales if you know the teaspoon amounts to make your developer. The key to that is to do it the same every time. And uh, I don't know how many times I say this, and I'm sorry if I sound like a stuck record, but you've got to do it the same every time. And as long as you do that, it's absolutely fine. You're gonna get just the same results and your photographs are gonna be as beautiful as anybody else's. So if you like teaspoons, use teaspoons. If you like scales, use scales. Rolando says, my D23 has become dark gray but still developing well. I replenish it every time for 20 rolls. Is this normal? Yes, it is normal. Um, you will find as you reuse a replenished developer, it will change. It 
the color comes, becomes gray. Sometimes you can see bits floating inside of it. That's fine. It's okay. It still develops the films just as well or better. So don't worry about that. I keep replenishing my developer for 30 films. Um, it's an arbitrary number. No magic in that number, but I find that at 30 films, I feel that it's time to, re to change it out. And what I do is I change out three quarters of the developer with fresh. So um, I basically toss uh, 750 mil of my one liter replenishment developer, leaving 250. And then I pour fresh D23 in back up to the one liter mark. So three quarters of the developer is fresh and it's already pre-seasoned because I used that quarter of the old developer. They call it old brown. Uh, it's pre-seasoned with old brown and I just carry on same timings, same everything. I just carry on using it for another 30 films. Do the same again. Three quarters are away, tossed away, fill it up with fresh, ba -ba -ba, off you go. Don't worry about these color changes as you're using it. Ian says, if I know I shall be using D23 at 1 plus 1, can I just mix 3.75 grams of metal with 50 grams of sulfite and make it up to 1 litre with water and use it straight out of the bottle without further dilution? Well, yes, Ian, absolutely you can. Um, you can do that with any developer if you're going to mix it just for one specific use at a diluted rate. Yeah, mix it purely at that diluted rate. But beware that it won't last as long as the full stock solution. And this is why we make stock solutions strong um, because they keep better that way. And they've got a lot of sulfite in there, which is uh, the preservative in D23. Um, and so it keeps a long time, at least six months on your shelf in an unopened bottle. Uh, and you know what? I think it keeps six months in an open bottle. I've never found a D23 that's gone off, um, actually. I'm sure they are out there, and if I left it long enough, it would. But I've never had a problem with that. So um, don't worry about that. Um, so yes, yes, you can dilute them. Fine. And um, by the way, if you're going to use D23 at 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2, or 1 plus 3, you can't replenish it. So you can only replenish the stock solution and use it as neat stock one plus zero for all your replenishment needs. The next video, stopping your developer going bad. Um, Greg asked, I used or he stated actually, I use compressed nitrogen with very good results. So in that video, I demonstrated using butane gas from um, a lighter refill uh, kind of spray bottle that they sell at the shop and you can squirt a little of this butane gas in the top of your bottles and, and it will um, help to preserve your developer and stop it oxidizing. Now, yes, I've heard of people using nitrogen before. Um, I can't buy nitrogen as easily as I can buy butane. That's one reason I use butane. But to me, there's an even more important reason to use butane rather than nitrogen. Butane is inert as is nitrogen, they're both inert. But butane is heavier than air. So when I squirt a little butane in the top of my developer bottle, I know that that butane will fall and sink and create a layer of heavy butane gas right over the liquid. It will not let the oxygen through to get to the liquid beneath. Whereas nitrogen is not heavier than air and just dilutes the oxygen in the bottle. If you can fully replace the oxygen with nitrogen, well done, good job, and it will do the same thing because there's no oxygen, right? But if you can't fully replace that oxygen with the nitrogen, or if you're not sure you've fully replaced it, you're still going to get some oxidization going on. So I do recommend butane as a simpler and more effective technique than nitrogen. The next video, let's make alkaline fix TF2. Max said, I was wondering about the difference between TF2 and TF3 since I shoot a lot of tea grain films. Your book says that you should avoid using TF2 with tea grain films, but does it make this fixed film combination not usable? 
TF2 fixer is an alkaline fix and it is made primarily with sodium thiosulfate. Sodium thiosulfate is not the best fixer for T grain or tabular grain films, and this includes Delta films from Ilford and some other films from other manufacturers that use this new technology. Now, a rapid fix is more effective for one of these tabular grain films. Um, a rapid fix is demonstrated in one of my videos, the AGFA 304 fix that I use, um, and it's made with ammonium chloride, which is added to the developer and helps to speed up the fixing. This is quite suitable for a tabular grain film, but a sodium thiosulfate fix like TF2 is a slow fixer and would take a long time to fully fix a tabular grain film. So I recommend going for the, the AGFA 304 uh, or TF3 if you can find ammonium thiosulfate, um, which is not as easy to get as um, ammonium chloride. Max also asked, do you still use a stop bath with this fix? Uh, the, dark room, the dark room cookbook says you don't have to use a stop bath, but you can use tap water instead. Is it also possible to go straight from developer to fix? Now, I've talked about using a water rinse instead of a stop bath earlier, so I won't repeat that. Um, uh, it does raise a little alarm bell here that he mentions a, a tap water rinse instead. Yes, tap water is good, but at the right temperature. Don't skip the temperature. It's got to be the same temperature within a degree or two of the developer. Is it possible to go straight from developer to fix? This is an interesting one. Now, when you go from a developer into a fixer, byproducts are created and these byproducts can stain your negatives or your prints. Now with prints, it's obvious because the stain is clear to see because of the white paper backing. With negatives, it's not so clear to see if you're staining your negatives by jumping from developer straight into fixer. So do not do that. It's much better to wash, rinse the film in 20 centigrade water before going into your fixer. This will remove the developer by and large, remove all of the developer so that it won't react with the fix and you won't get any of the staining problems. Remember, these are your negatives. These, you've gone outside, you've taken these negatives, you've taken these shots, they could have taken you weeks to complete, to finish a film, or you may have spent hours and hours trying to get the right photograph. Don't take chances like that where you may ruin your negative. Always err on the safe side and do the best you can to preserve that negative so it's going to be good. It's okay if the photograph is no good at the end of the day, that's fine but don't ruin the negative on the way to that photograph. Ways to ruin your negative, wrong temperatures. You know, all these different temperatures for your developer, your stop and your, your fix and your wash water as well. Don't mess with the temperature of the wash water. Try to keep it within a couple of degrees of all the others. These are just safety precautions to try to make the best negative you can. Uh, and then you can print it or you can scan it and you can do what you want with it, but at least you've got a good negative and it's, it's worth taking that extra special time and precautions. Um, okay, so time and temperature, how long should I develop my film for? Um, Stefan asks, in all the years I've been developing, I never thought to adjust time halfway through. Have noticed many a time that the developer seemed warmer at the end of the development period. Yeah, me too. And colder sometimes at the end of the development period as well. And this, of course, depends a lot on the temperature of the room you're in, um, on, all, on the temperature of the development tank when you started development compared to as it's warmed up by the end and so on. There's lots of reasons why the temperature will change throughout that development period. And even in short development periods of five, six, seven minutes, we're not talking necessarily about half an hour here. Even in short times, we don't know what temperature the developer is at throughout that development period. We can't monitor it precisely all the time, at least not with our home darkroom equipment. So what do we do? 
Well, my answer to that is to get the average temperature, to try to ascertain what was the average temperature over that development period. And the way to find the average temperature as best I can is to measure it halfway through the development time. I pop the top off the tank and I pop my thermometer in and I measure what is the temperature halfway through. And it's that temperature that I use to ascertain how long I should develop for. So the next video is the best darkroom paper developer. Now this was the developer, the E72 Eco developer. Chris asked, I've always read that phenidone was difficult to dissolve in water. You didn't think twice about doing just that. What is the difference between what you've done and here and make, sorry, what is the difference between what you've done here and making film developers that require phenidone to be dissolved in TEA or glycol? This is a, 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 good, a good question, Chris. Um, phenidone can be notoriously difficult to dissolve. And in my experience, that's when the phenidone is old. If the phenidone is fresh, it dissolves very, very easily. And this goes with a lot of chemicals, actually, when they begin to oxidize they start to get more and more difficult to dissolve. Glycine is another one. So what can you do about that? Well, first of all, try to find a supplier who gives you fresh phenidone. If you get a supplier and your phenidone dissolves very easily straight away, you're probably getting really good stuff. So keep that supplier of your phenidone. Um, another thing is if it starts to get harder and harder to dissolve the phenidone, you'll see this. It'll just take longer and longer to go into solution. Then no problem. That's when you can then get some glycol or get some TEA and dissolve the phenidone into that and then use a syringe to or a pipette to choose how much phenidone and, and suck out the amount of liquid to add the right amount of phenidone. You could make a 1% solution or a 5% solution of phenidone and, and then just decide how much to dish out. And I describe all that in my book of how to do that. The next video, um, and this is the penultimate one we'll talk about in, in this question and answer session. Unknown film and unknown development time. A uh, photo by Mike says, what happens when you change the times of A and B? So this was a video I did on Barry Thornton Two Bath. And I explained that if you don't know the film that you're developing, um, or you don't know the development time of the film that you're going to develop because it's not on in any documentation you've got or online. Um, how do you choose how long to develop it for? And so we use the Barry Thornton 2 bath, which is a great developer. It's really good. It's like, it's like D23, um, um, but it controls highlights very well. And it's a really good two bath developer for these occasions where you want to develop many films for the same development times. What happens when you change the times of A and B? Highlight difference or shadow difference? That's a really good question. And I've been asked similar questions by email as well about what is the difference with your A timings and your B timings with two bath developers? Now, Two bath developers, by and large, do some development in the A bath. So with the Barry Thornton two bath developer, you have a, a viable developer as the A bath. You don't need a, a B bath. You could use the A bath to fully develop your film if you wanted to. It's got six and a half grams of metal in there and plenty of sodium sulfite to actively develop. So. It's like D23, basically. Um, so it will develop the film. Now, this is the trick. If your A bath of your two bath developer is an active developer like Barry Thornton's, then the longer you develop it in the A bath, the more contrast you're going to get. The shorter you develop it in the A bath, the less contrast you're going to get. Now this is affected by the B bath which finishes, rapidly finishes off development because it's just an activator, it's just an alkaline. But um, if you're not getting enough contrast with your Barry Thornton 2 bath, give more time in bath A. Add a minute, see what it's like. Add another minute, see what it's like. 
you will perfect your timings like that. Um, if you're getting too much contrast, reduce the time in the A bath a little bit. Um, it's as easy as that. Uh, the next video is, um, oh, there are two more. I thought there was only one more. There's two more videos that I'm going to cover today. So the next video we're going to cover is one Ansel Adams in your developing tank. Now, um, this question comes from someone whose name is in a language that I can't read. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But they ask, what agitation method do you use for this developer? Now, this was the Barry Thornton two bath developer. And the agitation method I use is, is very straightforward. So I use basically a Kodak agitation in the A bath. So I agitate constantly for the first 30 seconds. And that makes sure the developer is soaked into the emulsion evenly. And then I agitate for five seconds every 30 seconds for that initial period of the A bath. Now, when I switch to the B bath, remember, no wash between the two. You, you empty the A bath out and then you pour in the B bath. I then agitate just for five seconds, just five seconds, because that will just make sure this B bath is mixed around the film nicely and evenly. And then I wait. And I wait about a minute and then I'll agitate just five seconds again. And then I wait and I keep doing that just five seconds each minute until it's completed its time in the B bath. The reason I don't agitate for the first 30 seconds again in the B bath is because I don't want to wash out all of that developer, a bath developer that's soaked into the emulsion. I want to keep it in the emulsion. And I want the B bath just to soak in slowly and activate and energize and finish the development that's going on inside of the emulsion. So don't wash it all out by a lot of sugaring in the B bath, just very gentle, five seconds initially, and then five seconds each minute in the B bath. So the last video that I'll cover um, in this Q and A session is drying marks, how to keep your negatives clean. Robert asked, is it possible to use two or three films in the same day in mixed wetting agent, or would you say it's best to mix fresh wetting agent for each roll? So let's just think about this. So drying marks, and of course also dust and dirt marks and things that are floating around um, that you want to wash away. Um, I always use fresh wetting agent when I develop a film. So if I'm doing two films, one after another, I will use my final rinse, put my final rinse in, um, and then add one or two drops of wetting agent and sugar the film so it mixes the wetting agent up around all the film and then leave it for two minutes. And then I take the film out, I give it a shake just to get them the worst of the water off it. And then I hang it up. And then for my next film, I'll do the same thing again. Fresh wetting agent. Put my last rinse in and two or three drops. Same thing all over again. I don't want to contaminate the film. If I've used that wetting agent for a previous film and there's anything at all in there, any dirt floating around, any dust floating around, anything that might put dirty marks of any kind on that film, I don't want to use that again. So fresh each time. That's my advice. Murgo asked, I use battery water or deionized water for diluting my chemistry. And for the last rinse with a drop of Infotol, I use an eyedropper and tap water for all the other washings. Yes, that's exactly what I do too. I use my tap water for all the washing of the film. And for a water stop bath, I use tap water. But only for the very last rinse do I use deionized water. Now, I'm very lucky here where I live is that my tap water is as good as deionized water. It's very clean and it has it doesn't seem to have any chemicals dissolved in it at all because I get no problems at all with drying marks. But if you have problems with drying marks, then your tap water isn't that pure. That's OK. They may put additives in at the uh, place where the water is, is uh, cleaned and sorted before it's sent to you. But 
If you get problems with drying marks, use deionized water as your last wash. You don't need to use it for all the others. Um, and that should give you clean negatives. And there's one last thing I want to say about drying marks. A lot of people do seem, and I get a lot of emails about drying marks, a lot of people do seem perturbed about drying marks. Honestly, they're not a big deal. If you get the odd drying mark spot on your negatives, you're probably never going to notice them. Certainly, if I look back at some of my negatives and there's any marks at all on them, they're not coming through when I'm printing. They're not affecting the print. I don't hold up my prints and go, oh no, there's a drying mark on my print. You know, it's come through. I don't get that problem. So really, don't get too uh, focused on getting rid of every single mark on your negatives. It's okay. The odd little drying mark's okay. It's not going to affect anything. All right. So that was the first, roughly the first half of the videos that I've made on YouTube. And I've covered some of the Q and A's that have been asked on those. If you found this interesting, if it's useful for you to hear my answers to these in a video like this, please drop right below and tell me it's okay to do this because it's the first time I've done this and I'm not sure if it's useful to you or not. For me, with people I follow on the internet, I don't go through every Q&A that's been asked on the videos. Um, and so whenever I've seen someone actually do what I've just done now, I've been quite happy to, to, to hear their answers to many of these questions. But you might be different and find this is a waste of time and you could have read this stuff anyway. So fine, that's good. Just let me know. And I will either do more of these or I won't do any more of these, okay? So thanks for watching. If you like any of my videos, do give me a thumbs up and do subscribe to the channel. Um, it helps motivate me to see my subscribers going up. And I thank you very much for watching. Um, and until next time, um, bon voyage. Ta-da. See you later. <laughs>